because it's time to get started. So hello, everyone. Um, we have something like 150 people on this call uh, from the US, Israel, Palestine, and other places around the world. And it's you know an auspicious and inauspicious time here. I know everybody has coronavirus on the mind and we're all you know really uh, accommodating to our new normal. All of us are at home, I think working, most of us are working from home. So it's kind of fitting maybe that we're having this webinar and, and, and doing this virtually. Um, this conversation is hosted by a group called Partners for Progressive Israel, which does a series of webinars like this to bring voices from the Middle East to an American and international audience. My name is Jody Rudoran. I'm the editor in chief of The Forward, the leading Jewish journalism outlet in the United States. I hope you're all signed up for our email newsletters and, and subscribe to us. But before I started at The Forward about six months ago, I was a journalist for more than two decades at the New York Times, including a tour as Jerusalem bureau chief, which is where I met uh, today's two wonderful, uh, impressive speakers. I'm gonna introduce them in a second. But first, let me just tell you a little bit about Partners for Progressive Israel. It's an American uh, nonprofit 501c3 organization that seeks to deepen Americans, and especially American Jews, understanding of Israel's complexities, and to advocate for a durable and just peace between Israel and its neighbors, and ensure the civil rights, equality, and social justice for everybody uh, in the region and for all of Israel's inhabitants specifically. I am not affiliated with the group. I was just asked to moderate this conversation, which I'm thrilled to do um, because of Aluf and Akiva. So I'll introduce them briefly. Um, Aluf Ben is the editor-in-chief of Haaretz, um, and he's been working there since 1989. I think he started when he was about 11. And he's been running the place since 2011, so for almost 10 years. And what I love in, about my conversations with Aluf over the years, is, and, and also reading him, is how he manages to always be both kind of very blunt and direct about what's going on, and very uh, sophisticated and insightful at the same time. He always tells the truth as he sees it, and his commentary is always based on, on his deep experience and filled with such sharp, fresh analysis. Joining us also is Akiva Elder, who uh, used to sit on the Haaretz editorial board and in fact worked at the paper for 35 years. So he and Aluf know each other so well. He was um, the chief political correspondent and US bureau chief among many other jobs there. Um, he also has been co-author of a biography of Shimon Peres and a book about Israeli sediments in the occupied territories. And he's now a columnist for Al Monitor, Al Monitor excuse me. Aluf and Akiva are two stalwarts of the Israeli Jewish left. And they've recently had a bit of a public back and forth over President Trump's police plan and specifically how Palestinians should respond to it, um, which is one of the things we'll be talking about today. Uh, before we jump in, let me just tell you a little bit about how this works. I'm going to um, ask our panelists questions for about 40 minutes, and then we'll turn to your questions. Um, the only way you can ask questions is by typing them, and you can do that at any time during the conversation. So at the bottom of your monitor, there should be an icon that says Q&A. And you may need to like touch your screen or run your mouse over it to find that icon. When you click on it, you'll see how you can type your question in the box that appears. Um, it won't disrupt the conversation or change your video or anything in any way, so don't worry about that. And um, I'll be able to look at the questions throughout the conversation and then when, when it's time, we'll turn to them. I think that's all the, all the business I gotta do, so let's get down to it. Um, it's, it seems like a long time ago since Trump announced his deal of the century peace plan back in January. Israel, of course, has had another, yet another election, the third in less than a year, the third involving the exact same players, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his chief challenger, Benny Gantz, the former IDF chief of staff and now head of a new coalition of political parties called Blue and White. I know, Aluf, since given how uh, distracted we've all been by the coronavirus and our own American political campaign news, I hope you could start us off with like an update on what happened in the March 2nd elections and what has happened since then and what's likely to happen next? Well, it's, uh, it's, it, it's still topsy-turvy because uh, this election once again ended without 
a clear winner. At the beginning, uh, based on the exit polls, uh, Netanyahu was uh, seen as the winner. Uh, he celebrated his victory. And then after a couple of days, when the actual final results came out, it appeared that he only had in his block of supporters, 58 out of 120 members of Knesset. Far short of the 61 needed for a pure right-wing coalition that would one way or another do away with his, uh, with his criminal trial through some uh, private legislation or, or a new attorney general would stop the, the court on its tracks or whatever. Uh, a couple of days later, so Gantz started celebrating his block of anti-BB of 62. But then uh, it fell apart as well because some of the more right-winger, uh, right-leaning members of this makeshift uh, coalition uh, broke away because they said they could not support the government based on the support of the joint list of the party representing the Arab society in Israel. Uh, and they were not deterred by uh, accusations of racism uh, and of, uh, of undermining the overall uh, overarching goal of replacing Netanyahu. And then came the coronavirus, which was uh, already the background. I think that during the election, maybe six or seven or 10,000 people were voting in special designated uh, polling stations for, uh, for people in quarantine. Wow. Now, obviously, it's expanded. Uh, tonight, the government is about to announce the closure of all the schools in Israel. And uh, right now, you see me in my office, but it's uh, the final hours of everybody working from the office. As of Sunday, we're starting to run Haaretz from our homes. Wow. And, uh, and the worst is yet to come forward. You know, people are afraid of, of curfews, of... Uh, some of the supermarkets are, are empty from uh, uh, conserved food and, uh, and so on. So this is where we are. The coronavirus crisis once again positions Netanyahu as a national father figure. He's running the daily press conferences in a similar way to way, the way he did it during the Gaza war six years ago with the Minister of Healthcare and uh, the Chief of uh, the National Security Council and the Chief of the Healthcare Ministry and uh, they announced the new measures to the Israeli public. And uh, the new bon ton in the political talk is once again, a unity government, uh, which to me, it's, it's, it's not unity. It's, it's Netanyahu running the show and Gantz serving him as defense minister and all but uh, leaving out the chance of, or any hope of replacing Netanyahu in the near future with uh, the Netanyahu trial that's uh, supposed to be to begin on March 17. Uh, on Tuesday, will probably be postponed because of the coronavirus and uh, general trouble. So this is where we are. 90% uh, of the news cycle today in Israel is, is dominated by the virus and by the change, uh, radical changes in, in everybody's lifestyle. Akiva, what do you, can you talk a little bit about what you think the, the different scenarios are that might happen next and, and what you think is most likely? I mean, Alufa referred to the possibility of either a Netanyahu-led coalition that looks similar to what we have, or maybe a crisis unity government, uh, perhaps partly motivated by, by the actual crisis, right, that, that we're in. What else do you see as possible? Actually, I just uh, saw the uh, Minister of Internal Defense, the other Dan, on television, suggesting that uh, they need to form a kind, uh, as, as Aluf mentioned, uh, everything is dominated, of course, by the coronavirus, to form a very a special emergency coalition based on the agenda of fighting the corona. Um, he said, even let's do it for six months. And then we can always go back to the president or to the Knesset and call for early elections or form another government. But right now, and I think that this is, uh, he's reaching out to the Israeli public opinion, which is 99% focusing on the uh, corona and of course the, the implications. They look at the NASDAQ, they look at the, uh, at the markets here in Israel. Yeah. The supermarkets are empty, um, and what people 
want, uh, as you know, Jody, when there is a time of war in Israel, an emergency, there is no left and right. We are all united behind the government, no matter what kind of government. Now, would you imagine uh, then that if that happened, that that would include Gantz and some of the other leaders from Blue and White? Um, maybe they will find a solution. As you know, President Rivlin went back to square one. What he suggested is a unit of government with rotation. And they will have to find a way that uh, Netanyahu will not be off the hook of his uh, uh, of the uh, uh, as Aluf mentioned, on next week he will have to sit in, in court or uh, to admit guilty or not guilty. Uh, so there are, the indictments are there and they're not going anywhere. And uh, Gantz cannot afford now to let Netanyahu be a prime minister who will spend half a day in court and the other half uh, taking crucial decisions, such as actually the corona is putting him in a very special position. Uh, for instance, to, to uh, decide whether he wants to close down the, uh, the schools in Israel. Uh, and what does he do with the budget? There is a big yeah. hole in the budget. And uh, now they will have to deal with um, people who are not able to pay their mortgages and people who uh, will be laid out. For instance, El Al is closing down. Um, so th there are great implications. So the, the priorities and the agenda have completely changed and this may dictate also the uh, new political uh, scenario um, and, and uh, the steps that both Netanyahu, Rivlin and, and Gantz will have to take. Right. So obviously everybody's focus has been on, on Netanyahu and Gantz, but this call was you know framed as being about the Israeli left and I want to talk a little bit about what the election um, showed us about that. Um, we, we have traditionally and historically thought of the Israeli left really as the Israeli Jewish left or Zionist left and thought about Meretz and labor, who of course combined for this uh, round of the election after poor performances in the first two rounds. And they ended up with, is it six seats or seven seats? Some very small number, right? And then where the one, the one of them belongs to a right winger. And yeah. one of them belongs to a right winger. Okay. And and then we have the joint list, as Aluth mentioned, that really is now the third largest party with, I think it's an unprecedented 15 seats. So let's let's talk a little bit, maybe you start Akiva, but what, what, I mean, what does that mean for what we've traditionally understood as the Israeli left? Um, is it over? Um, first of all, Jody, it means that uh the Israeli Jewish left or the Zionist left will have uh, to review its uh, agenda, its profile, its uh, everything that uh, was meaning, you know, what, what it means left for Israel is going to change. Um, with no, without alliance, I think one of the reasons that people moved from Meretz to, Aluf told me that 20,000 Jews voted for the joint Arab list um, is that there was no Arab. The first Arab candidate was number 11 uh, in the list. And, and people in saw this- In which list? In the merits list? In the, the merits, in the merits labor uh, Gesher list. So it made, first of all, Arabs who voted for merits in April moved to the uh, joint list, to the, the Arab list. The other thing is that um, if we are here together now to talk about Trump's plan, the peace process, if they will not be able to bring back the conflict, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the occupation, the settlements back to the uh, agenda, to the public discourse, they have nothing to offer. Because what uh, Amir Peretz wanted to believe is, and, and that's the reason that he joined, as Aluf mentioned, uh, only Levi Abuksis, who is a member of the right, is that um, they can put uh, on the top of the list of the agenda social economic issues, and it doesn't work. It is about security, and also it was uh, based on corruption and not corruption, if you like Bibi, if you don't like Bibi. 
once Bibi is away, I think this is uh, uh, a precedent. This can be a precondition for forming a new agenda for Israel, for recovering the left, because uh, blue and white took over because the Israeli uh, public was split between only Bibi, just Bibi, or not. We're fed up. Everything we are willing to form a new party between right wingers such as uh, Yoaz Hendel, Hauser, and Bogi Alon, and on the other hand, uh, Ofer Shelach uh, and Yael German, who was a member of Ratz. Um, so once it's not a discussion about Bibi's personality, it's not about King Bibi, but we are going back to normal issues, for instance, budget. And, uh, um, and peace, then maybe the, the Israeli left will have something to offer to the discourse. But, but, I mean, one of the ways that the joint list has managed to grow from its former component parts over the last several elections, not even in the cycle, but back to, I think, 2013 and 15, 2015, I guess, when it's first ran, um, is by not focusing on the big questions of peace and um, settlements, but by talking about services for Arab communities within Israel. So isn't that part of the decline? Like that, so that, that what, you know, this idea that the left has shifted from Meretz, which was all about what will the future of Israel-Palestine be, to a totally different con constellation of things that really isn't about that. Is this just about the Israeli public feeling so fatigued by the Palestinian question and not being able to get anywhere in the stalemate? I think that uh, they, they ought to send a bunch of flowers to Lieberman and to, to Bibi. First of all, it started with Lieberman uh, lifting the threshold, uh, hoping that uh, the, the Arabs will drop under it, and that made them unite under one flag, which is equality and showing Lieberman that, uh, and themselves that uh, they, they have something to offer. Number two was Netanyahu, his incitement against them. If you remember what he said, that the left is bringing them on buses to the yeah, no, stations. I, mean, I think so, you're right about what the background is for the emergence of the Arabs, but I wonder, Aluf, maybe you can jump in here about the, what feels like just the complete collapse of the old left. Well, the complete collapse of the old left began on July 25th, 2000, when we stood at the basement of the, of the Hampton Inn Motel in Frederick, Maryland, listening to Ehud Barak, who just came out of the Camp David conference, and told us that there is no partner on the Palestinian side. That was the end of the Israeli left. It took a while, uh, and I think the aftermath was, uh, the final act was the Gaza disengagement followed by the Hamas takeover in Gaza and the Palestinian split. And since then, even the, and I think it's been polled time and again, and in all these polls where the majority of Israeli respondents said that they would support a two-state solution principle, when the same people in the same sample was asked, will it happen? They said, no, it's not practical. And, and, and the outcome is the same. I mean, if you believe in something and it's not happening, you don't believe that it's going to happen, then you could say you support it because you want to differentiate yourself from right-wingers, from sectors, from religious people, whatever. That's one issue. The other issue is that the anti-clerical, the anti-religious sentiment, that was the key of Shulamit Aloni, the founder of Meris, the big, the big... Uh, uh, mother. Big mother of the Israeli left. She was a staunch anti-clerical uh, uh, politician. But that, that line was expropriated, first by Lapid, by the father and the son, and now by Lieberman. So yeah. now we have a secular right-winger is fighting Shas. Well, the left is saying, well, one day we're gonna need Shas, and the alliance with uh, Shas is not as bad as, as with the uh, settlers and, and so on. So and of course, the Israeli public cares more about that yeah. identity question of secular. It lost the agenda. Number two, since 2005, and the decline of the Second Intifada, the cost of the status quo to the Israeli public with the occasional interruptions from Gaza. But Gaza appears to be out of the question because there is no suggestion of peace process with Hamas. Holding the West Bank and East Jerusalem 
is acceptable yeah. to the Israeli public. We don't feel that we pay any enormous price for doing that. And last but not least, the right wing since 2009 focused on fighting the Israeli Arab society and on measures to differentiate uh, the Arab voting bloc in order to delegitimize its political representation, in order to prevent any resumption of a left-wing government. Because a left-wing government is dependent. We have two great growing minorities in Israel. The ultra-Orthodox who are firmly on the right-wing side and Arabic speakers who are counted, although they are different than Zionist left, but they're not Zionist, but they're counted among the left. And, and Gantz, to his credit, was the first Israeli politician, the first Israeli political leader who met with the leaders of the Arab parties on camera. Not even Rabin did that, not Olmert, nobody. Even those who wanted their support always did it off the record. And uh, this is important, but it's not enough because there's still the, the, the fear of appearing to be what Bush Herzog, the former leader of the center left said, uh, people blame us that we love the Arabs, and so they vote against us. It's still a paralyzing fear among, among many politicians in Israel, and there's no majority for that. Uh, clearly, the, the achievement of the joint list is phenomenal, uh, and, uh, and, and you see that, you see that, that our politicians are, are much more of mainstream faces in, in mainstream Israeli media. It, in the past, it was, you know, they would, they would be invited to the studio just to be asked, why did you go to the funeral of this or that terrorist or whatever? And now they're, they're seen as, as political entity. And I think this is the unintended consequence of the most important thing that the Netanyahu government did, which was the nation state law of a year and a half, almost two years ago. It's almost forgotten. But in the unintended consequence was that it pulled the Arab society into the system. Yep. And, and the turning point, the tipping point was then when Ayman Oda, the head, the, the initiator and the head of the joint list, when he said in an interview with Yudhiyot Achonot, I didn't like the fact that he went to the competition, but, but I understood why he did that, because he went there and for the first time he was, they did not ask him about why did you support Assad or Hezbollah or this or that terrorist, but at the same time he said that his agenda was focused on law enforcement, better economic situation, planning and zoning in the Arab society, and that made him a household name for many Israelis. So we see change within Israeli society, and the Palestinians are all but forgotten. The only parties that mention the Palestinians or the West Bank at all in Israeli elections are the far right, you mean our Bennett's party. They're the only ones who demand annexation and, and yeah. building settlements. All the others, I'm totally silent about it. But I must say that you know, the last time I, I was interviewed by Charlie Rose was four years ago. And, uh, and, and he put it, I think he put it, he put it in a great way when he asked me, so the political debate in Israel today is between the right and the far right. And that was true four years ago. And in many ways, it's still true today because Gantz accepted the Trump plan uh, and uh, supported, uh, although with some conditions, the idea of annexation, it didn't, it didn't rule it out. And that's different than the when the nation state law was enacted, all the parties in opposition, including Lapid, Gantz was not on the scene yet at the time, all of them voted against it. Uh, and and uh, I think this is really the, the, the uh, uh, fault line in Israeli politics. Do you support? Are you Jewish or Israeli? Are you more Jewish or more democratic? If you're more democratic, then you support the anti bb cause. And, and the, the tactical change was that Lieberman, who was firmly on the right wing side ideologically, because of his issues with Netanyahu, joined the other side. Yep. But now he's indicated that he's going to jump back to the unity. So, uh, I want to remind everybody, we do have a couple of questions in the queue. You can send them at any time. Um, we'll turn to their, your questions in another 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I'm glad you brought up um, Aluf, that, that moment the, after Camp David and um, with Ehud Barak, because I want to get back to the question of American peace plans and, and the latest one, the Trump peace plan. And you wrote this very provocative piece saying that Palestinians should uh, surrender unconditionally 
uh, as Germany and Japan did no, at the end. No, of that this, is, that this is what, what Trump is demanding. Trump, Trump the Palestinians amounts to unconditional surrender and accepting and accepting to be kind of the poor neighbor of an Israeli con living in an Israeli controlled area in return for some economic development. But right, I'm sorry, but what I meant to say is that like, you know, but the, the parallel, if that were to happen, you know, there's, although there's a kind of um, acquiescence that feels very problematic, maybe the long-term result, looking from today, doesn't, doesn't necessarily feel, it's not the end of the Palestinian movement in the way that a lot of people thought it would be. But so tell us more about what, what do you think surrender unconditionally would mean? What would that, where would that leave them? And would it, could it be a stable future forward? I think that the major surprise that happened was that for many, many years, the Israeli peace camp, and apparently the Palestinian peace camp as well, uh, built on the American pressure to drive Israel out of the territories, which uh, happened in Sinai with President Carter, and it happened in Gaza with, with President Bush and, and Sharon. It didn't happen in the West Bank. And I, think it, and I think nobody anticipated an American government that would outflank this Israel from the right. And basically issue a plan saying that the Palestinian national movement is a fake and that it should forego its uh, historic narrative and uh, throw away everything that they believe in and uh, teach their children, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and rewrite it and, and, and open a new chapter and more or less follow the dictate of Netanyahu. And you could find copy-pasted paragraphs from Netanyahu's writings in the Trump peace plan. And I think this was unexpected. And my question to the Palestinian leadership was that, you know, when, you, when they rejected Camp David 20 years ago, uh, assuming that over time they would get a better, a better proposal, which they got from Barak in Taba several months later, and then from Olmert in 2008, those were not sufficient to them, and in any event, and in any event, uh, the the Israeli governments uh, were too weak to to implement them. But looking back, was it smart to say no at the time? Because what they get now is double or more the number of settlers, uh, much less international support. The Arab Spring and the Syrian civil war, which turned the attention of everybody in the world to other problems in the Middle East that the Palestinians are not involved in. And, you know, when you have millions of refugees from Syria, that are refugees, you know, of, of this decade, who would care about the refugees of, of seven decades ago? And, uh, and, and, I, and I think that this is, this is a very big question uh, to the Palestinian leadership. Uh, and with, and with uh, the split between Gaza and the West Bank, you know, you can all adhere to the Geneva Accord of 2003 and say this is the only possible peace plan. How do you reconcile it with the existence of an armed Hamas-led Palestinian enclave uh, runners dictatorship in Gaza that is not going anywhere? Right. I mean, which, which brings us, I think, Akiva, to the, to the question that I feel like every conversation about the place really circles around, which is whether the two-state solution is still at all viable uh, now in the future, is the two-state solution already dead? Um, what happens if, if there's, if you know, doesn't, if it's only a po possible twenty years hence, um, and and what happens if it really is dead? Um, you see, there is a paradox here that the uh, language that even the Israeli radical right is using is also when they are talking about annexing Area C. Area A, B, and C is a product of Oslo B. So uh, we are still living with Oslo. If you look at the polls, the majority of the Israelis support the two-state solution. They are not in love with it, but if you, between the option of a one-state solution, status quo, uh, and a two-state solution, which is based on the Arab Peace Initiative with security guarantees, with maybe, uh, major support, economic support. Now we, we actually, we need it more than ever after the corona. Um, if, it would, if it would look attractive enough, or if America will put its foot down, 
And I think that we lost the eight years of Obama was trying, was playing with the settlements. And if uh, we, we had President Carter now, or even Bush senior that said, you have to choose between long guarantees uh, and the special relationship with the United States and promoting settlements. And he said it to Shamir and Shamir said, I can have it both ways. And he lost the elections to, to Rabin because uh, there, there is a red line that the Israelis won't cross as this is opening a war against the United States because they don't know what we do is it if we win. Um, can we occupy the United States? That, that's going too far. But, uh, or, uh, you know, there is a joke that Israel was the American president offered Israel to become the 51, 51st state and said, no, no, please don't do this because that uh, means that we'll have only two senators. So um, uh, I, I think that still the majority of the Israelis, the mainstream, uh, and the, of course the left are willing, and, and you see Sharon was the one who disengaged from Gaza and part of the West Bank, if you remember, from the north part of the, the Samaria area. And it was Sharon who did it. Um, so what we need is a kind of Sharon Rabin leader. If, let's say, if Bibi Netanyahu would decide today to do what Olmert did, to move all the way to the left and say, um, maybe the only way to fight the corona is to get out of the territories because we can't control the borders. You know, we have uh, every day tens of thousands of Palestinian workers crossing and you can't check them because they are not afraid. They, they know that they will be arrested, but they still, they have to bring bread back home. So they cross the border. We can't control it. Um, so um, I, I, I believe that the Israeli left has good product in its hands, but they are very, their marketing is very poor. Their marketing and, you know, Netanyahu was a, started his career as selling uh, lousy furnitures, the rim furnitures. I don't know if they exist anymore, no, but, but he has learned since then. He, he has learned how to market himself and to market a fake agenda. And the real agenda belongs to the Israeli left. Um, I want to jump in because we only have a few more minutes till we turn to the audience questions. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about, um, you know, your um, your your back and forth in the op eds and and this webinar is of course talking about the Palestinians and their future without any Palestinians here, which we often get criticized for, and of course, which is one of the things that I and others criticized Trump's peace plan for for not even really considering uh, involving uh, Palestinians. And I wonder what you'd say about how the left, the Israeli Jewish left, the American Jewish left, the Zionist left, let's say, can make sure to consistently include Palestinian voices and perspectives in the discussion, particularly given, as Aluf alluded to, the division, the official division of the Palestinians between the factions and the kind of general devolution of the Palestinian kind of polity, the, the strength of the leadership, the PA and the PLO leadership. How do we um, deal with that? Yeah, um, I, I'm sure that Aluf remembers my interview with Arafat in 2004 with uh, our friend uh, Zichon Olivrachah David Landau and where Arafat, the headlines of Haaretz was, of course, I understand that Israel is a Jewish and has to be a Jewish state. Um, and uh, I, I met with Arafat a few times and actually I read in Haaretz today, the uh, archive, uh, the Israeli archive was open for um, some documents of uh, protocols of meetings between and, and a dialogue between Rabin and Paris and I find it fascinating. I recommend you to read it. And what, what I, I think is that the Palestinian mistake, the mistake they did was in 88, when they accepted Resolution 242, they gave up the charter, the uh, um, military war against Israel. They understood that violence will not bring them anywhere, but they assumed at that time 
And that what they got in return was opening a dialogue with uh, the Reagan administration. This was in the transition time. And um, their assumption, and Arafat paid the price for it, that uh, the, the PLO was divided. Um, and the assumption was that they will get the 22% of uh, the mandatory Palestine, and Israel will be happy with the 78%. At that time, the, the settlement were not a major issue. Back in 88, there were a few thousand, 10,000, 20,000 settlers. And the, the, it's like we are negotiating apples and oranges. They, their negotiations are based on, okay, you won the war, you got your 78%. Now we are willing to make some modifications of the 67 borders uh, with a swap. And this is what Olmert realized that that has to be the basis of the negotiation, that it has to be based on 67, and we have to give up the 48 narrative, both of us, the Palestinians and the Israeli. Now, uh, time works against the Palestinians because uh, the majority of the Israelis were born into the occupation, were born, uh, how many Israelis remember the pre-67 lines, uh, the, the uh, reality? So, um, we are negotiating with them. We say, okay, we have half a million uh, settlers. Where are they going? You have to take this into consideration. And they were willing. Now, look at the Arab Peace Initiative that has been waiting for us since March 2002. Actually, uh, at, the, at, the, at the end of this year, uh, it will be 27 years. And there, is, there was no Israeli cabinet that even discussed it seriously. Uh, there was, was a lot of lip service. And here, this is what they're offering Israel. They're offering regional peace. And um, what the Palestinians cannot offer us is security, a kind of a Middle East NATO, and a coalition, a kind of President Bush coalition against Iran to isolate Iran. So, and, and we are not taking it seriously. As Alouf said, we say, well, look, the status quo is not too expensive. We can live with the status quo. Right. But what, what happens 20 years from now? Right now, uh, there is a majority of a non-Jewish majority between the Mediterranean and the river. What do we do with it? Right. Um, so we're going to turn to audience questions in just one second. But Aluf, I want you to jump in a little bit on what Akiva just ended with and also with that question of how the uh, Jewish left how responsible is it to include its Palestinian voices and perspective, and how, how can we ensure that that happens? Question, the question from, from an Israeli local point of view is whether, whether the joint list will become the new platform, a new platform for Jewish-Arab cooperation within Israel. Because it is the largest left-wing party today in Israel, right. and it's apparently going to remain so in the foreseeable future. Look, Netanyahu, as Akiva said, Netanyahu had a unique opportunity to do whatever he could uh, in the peace process because he enjoys this kind of uh, overarching security and, and, and diplomatic authority, political authority in Israel. But he achieved that authority by refusing to budge and to move an inch. And to, from his point of view, the dilemma is that any Israeli leader would be facing is between a civil war on our side or exporting it to the other side. But look, another, this was Begin and Sharon also. No, but Begin with, and Sharon ran on the same ticket of but, uh, but, not but, giving back an inch. Okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna um, turn to our questions. Actually, a couple of our questioners um, asked one of the questions I didn't get to, sort of. So I'm gonna use those. I'm gonna I think I'm gonna offer two at once. So first we have from um, Dr. Ayala Emmet, who says, since you think Israel would not start a fight with the U.S., do you think that with Democrats win, there would be a chance to change the dynamic for two states. And then Jerome Siegel has this question saying, pointing out that Biden is exposed to annexing the West Bank. So if he clearly states that he would not accept um, an annexation, would that actually work to prevent one? And would you expect the Palestinian attitudes to change if Biden were elected. So, and actually the way I was gonna frame this question is a little even broader, which is to sort of game out the various option of a sort of Netanyahu-Trump alliance, Netanyahu-Biden alliance, uh, trump Gans, trump uh, biden Gans, or what happens if Bernie Sanders somehow comes back and wins. So 
I think broadly speaking, all of us want to know how you think the American election is likely to change the dynamic over the Israeli-Palestinian question. Well, first of all, uh, what we know from the past is that American governments, they, they always like to rewrite the previous uh, American administration's plans for the Middle East. But we know that even grudgingly, they always accept unilateral Israeli acts. Uh, you know, from the Declaration of Independence, which just like today happened on an American election year when the incumbent was not sure of his re-election, uh, to, you know, uh, declaring Jerusalem as the capital of Israel by Ben-Gurion, the construction of the Demona nuclear reactor, the, the, the Six-Day War, etc., etc. Now, what we're facing today is a practical question. Will Biden or Sanders move back the American embassy to Tel Aviv and just close down the embassy in Jerusalem? I don't think so. And regarding annexation, in my opinion, the time to watch an annexation is, is either one of two, either before November as a kind of gift from Trump to his evangelical Jewish supporters, et cetera, et cetera. This is a time to watch. He would not have given it to Netanyahu for his own election, but for the American election. And the other is, if Trump is defeated, again, the transition period is usually when <clears throat> American and Israeli governments uh, um, do the crazy stuff. This was when the Eisenhower administration exposed the Dimona reactor, all the way to Obama abstaining on the uh, uh, UN Security Council resolution recognizing Palestine and outlawing the settlements. So the time to watch is November and shortly after that on annexation. Now, I don't, I don't believe that the Biden administration, especially after a devastating economic crisis that everybody will be facing in this year, would take office and the first thing they do is try to reawaken the dream of the two-state solution. I'm not saying that it's dead, I'm just saying that it's not going to be right. high on their agenda, apparently. Uh, Jody, I, I think that what uh, Biden will have to do, uh, or any Democratic president, is just do a detour back to the roadmap. And uh, when I, I met with Obama's people, I suggested, like to Dan Shapiro, that the only thing they have to do is say, go to the Congress with the roadmap that uh, was submitted by President Bush. And the roadmap is talking about the Arab Peace Initiative, He's talking about a two-state solution with Jerusalem. Actually, what they have to do about Jerusalem is just to put another American flag in East Jerusalem and open uh, a, an embassy in, in Palestine. Uh, two embassies is two for one. So um, I, I see it. Th there is a consensus in the American Congress that the best solution is the two-state solution. I think there is a consensus in the Jewish community in the United States, that we, we need to separate from the Palestinians. We need uh, to get a, a good divorce lawyer before we get a rabbi to, to get married. <laughs> and and uh, there are many good Jewish lawyers. So I, I think that uh, the new American president will not have to invent a new wheel. There is, it's there, it's all there. There are the Clinton parameters, yeah. And uh, there is the, the Madrid process that was started by George. So it's a bipartisan issue. Sure. And it will be very easy to bridge between the uh, two sides of the aisle. I'm going to take some, do some more questions. We have a number that relate to the joint list. So I'm going to go through them and see if you can answer them kind of collectively. Um, from Dan Fleschler, he points out that politicians in blue and white um, have been refusing to form a government that depends on the support of the joint list and asks how they are publicly justifying it. Are they even bothering only, to respond only two of them. to charges of racism? What? Only two of them. Only two out of the 33. Two, but, maybe three. Wait, two have rejected the idea, right? Yeah, but the thing is that is during the- keep responding to the charges of racism? Yeah, well, they, they just ignore it. Look, during the campaign, the leaders of Blue and White, and Gantz in particular, 
pledged not to form a government based on the support of the joint list. And not only that, they ran their entire campaign trying to attract voters from the right, which they right. failed. And, uh, and at that time, they put forward these two right-wing uh, blue and white politicians as their poster boys. Right. And then it changed after the election. They changed, and they said, and the, the explanation I just heard Bogi Alon explaining today, one of the leaders of blue and white, that it's true that we said that we would not join forces with the joint list, but replacing Netanyahu is far more important to Israel, and uh, therefore we are willing to we were willing to sacrifice our campaign pledge in order to do that. Well, those who blame the racists, they would just stick with the platform. The next question related to this is from Alexander uh, Longarov, who wants to know what the stance of the joint list has been in recent days regarding the formation of the government. I, I believe that uh, they are waiting to see, before they say yes, they're wanting to see if there is a Jewish partner on the other side. Um, because they have, uh, I, I just uh, wrote an article for our monitor that we'll be able, you'll be able to, to read this evening, is that for the Islamic movement, which is a faction of the uh, joint list, for them, this is not easy to uh, join forces with a Zionist party, with, okay. with guns, with three former generals and one deputy head of the Mossad. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have to look at, on the other side, we always look at ourselves, we look at the mirror, but we, we have to look at, uh, and, and the, as you mentioned, Judy, for, for us, for us, the, the willing of the joint list of the uh, more than half a million Arabs who voted for them to support a Zionist, because, you know, a, a Zionist Jewish party and prime minister, uh, candidate for prime minister, who was chief of staff, and he was bragging about how many Arabs he killed in Gaza. Um, so they are, I think that at the end of the day, as Alouf mentioned, the number one issue is getting rid of Netanyahu. Netanyahu is the devil, and for them, as well as for many of us. Uh, and in order to stop the devil, uh, some people are more afraid of Netanyahu than of the corona. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, um, this relates um, directly to a question we have from Mark Gold, who points out that the joint list is a union of convenience that was created to address those local conditions that I think Aluf spoke of earlier um, in the Arab community. So uh, Mark is asking how important the differences among the, within the list are for that, for their future as a political force and as a, as a vehicle for the left's expression. Do you think, I mean, speaking about the Islamic movement as part of it, there are some Jews as part of it. What, how are those, how likely is the joint list likely to stay unified in order to really be a force? It remains to be. They stayed unified in uh, three, th those three rounds, no? There is, no, no, it's split and then it's reunited. It's split and then it's reunited. There are no, uh, there is no love affair among its leaders. But uh, they realized that they better cooperate. And clearly, these Israeli voters, both Arabs and Jews, in the last two rounds of elections, showed clear tendency to vote for larger parties. Now, today, we have only eight political parties in the Knesset, which is, by American standards, it's huge, but it's the smallest number of parties that Israel has ever had in its history. And, uh, and, and again, a, a party of 15, even if it remains in opposition, if you have this uh, emergency government, and Ayman Oda and Tibi become the leaders of the opposition, it gives them a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, clout within the Israeli system. And uh, I don't think they're so willingly would want to forego it. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions from our friends in Europe. Um, Memi Campana, Campana, who's an Italian teacher, says, notes that in Europe, the expression Jewish and democratic state, especially in Italy, she says is very worrying because every ethnic connotation will weaken any sense of constitutional or secular democracy. Um, so does, does Israel run the risk of slipping into a concept of, a, of an ethnically pure state? And I, I, I was gonna ask a question similar to this. You know, Americans too, we have this, I think the vast majority of American Jews believe that Israel should be a Jewish state, believe that it should be a democratic state, believe those two things are, you can have them together. And I think sometimes 
maybe we are fooling ourselves. Well, the, the, the position yeah. of the current list and its uh, more vocal component is definitely that it cannot reconcile being Jewish and democratic. And that's, uh, that, one, that, that a Jewish state, by its nature, emphasizes one part of society, even if it's the majority, uh, compared to others. Now, several years ago, Pew Research did a survey of Israeli public opinion with 5,000 respondents, which is you know, it's like 10 times the usual sample of polling in Israel. 79% of the Jewish respondents said that in a Jewish state, Jews should have more rights than non-Jews. And that included 46% of those that self-identified as seculars, and obviously 96% of those identified as, as religious. This is huge. So, so this is not something that is kind of a couple of racists out there are saying that Jews should have more rights. And in practice, this is the way things have been in Israel for over 70 years. And, and, and it's very difficult to change. So uh, clearly that doesn't, uh, uh, that doesn't uh, reconcile with the way Europeans see their democracy or Americans see their democracy. Uh, and, uh, but, but that's, what, uh, that's how the majority of Israelis would, would see that. And the joint list and the Jews who voted for it. And, and, and apparently if there's going to be kind of, of a Jewish Arab party in the future, its platform would be a kind of democratic state with, uh, with the Jewish public face, but not self-declared as, as an ethnocracy. I think at the end of the day, Israel will have to decide whether it wants to be a state of all its citizens or just a Jewish state. There is an inherent paradox in the Zionist idea that says um, equal rights to everyone, but the Jews have extra rights, political rights, and the Arabs don't have self-determination rights, so to speak. First of all, I believe that once we will find a solution to the Palestinian problem, then it will be easier for the Israeli Arabs to decide if they are part of, first of all, part of Israel or part of the Arab world. And the other thing is um, we are walking on a very thin rope here with democratic and Jewish state. Now, in the last 10 years, we had a prime minister that was walking on it like an elephant in a China store. And what we will need is uh, a prime minister or a new leadership that will rewind it, that will be able to uh, start promoting democracy, uh, demography and peace. I remember at the time when Yossi Sarid and Shulamit Aloni were ministers of education, they were peace studies at school. Now it's more about the Bible and the Jewish heritage and they take children to Hebron and uh, to Ir David, and they keep teaching them only that there is only one narrative. There were no Palestinians here, the Palestinians have no rights, and um, the, the children that uh, uh, are now serving in the army were born into after Oslo. They, they know nothing about 67. For them, there is no difference between the 48 war or the 67 war. It's part of, of the history, and you know, don't give me this bullshit. I want uh, to uh, be an Israeli patriot and I am Jewish. And uh, I'm, as, as Aluf mentioned, they would love to wake up one morning and find out that the Arabs had faded, faded away. So turning um, back to the Palestinian question, Eric Levine asks, says he's been reading a lot of, about the Confederation model and wondering what your take on it is both conceptually and practically? Well, I don't know exactly what it means. Uh, and, and, you know, in the end of the day- Palestinian-Jordanian confederation? In the end of the day, the, the big question is, who is calling the shots uh, security? Who is guarding the border? Who, who decides who could get in and who cannot? Who decides who's get arrested and for what and who's not? Whose hands is on the is on the trigger, and uh, and uh, you know all the all these plans, uh, we're, we're not in shortage of plans and maps and ideas of cooperation and ideas of of uh, disengagement. The big question is the political will 
to do that and to take risks. And we know that the risk of civil war is not imaginary. We had a civil war after Oslo. And it was only one casualty, but it was Prime Minister Rabin. So it was a very, very uh, considerable casualty and it changed, and it changed, you know, it, it derailed the peace process. And then before the Gaza disengagement, again, there was not a violent civil war, but there was very major conflict within Israeli society. And clearly that was Gaza. Move it to the West Bank. The larger number of settlers, could they really be removed? What, the, what Netanyahu's input into the peace process was not to remove any settler or any settlement. And that was because, and, 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 the, and the Trump plan says that, because they didn't, they, he, did, he didn't want, and it still doesn't want, an Israeli domestic conflict. He prefers to have the Palestinian store between Fatah and Hamas. And the one thing that Israel prevented, the Olmert government, as well as the Netanyahu government, time and again, is an intra-Palestinian rapprochement between Fatah and Hamas. Whenever there was a talk of reconciliation of a joint government, Israel stepped in and prevented it. And therefore, the issue of confederation is 10 steps beyond yeah. having the ability to take these risks, and for what? And if the cost of the status quo to Israeli society, to the Israeli political leadership, to Israel's foreign status, even to Israel's stance within the region vis-a-vis -vis the, the Sunni powers who are fighting Iran and are opposing Turkey in the region, if Israel could get all these benefits, if the Israeli foreign minister could have his picture taken in Dubai without giving one-tenth in an outpost, why risk it? I have what's, two, two. The incentive? what's the incentive? The, the, the idea that the occupation is not sustainable, we've been hearing this song and dance for 53 years now. I, I have two comments. One is Arafat said, um, and more than once, that he's willing to consider confederation if he will get an independent state for one day. So then it can be between Israel and Palestine, two equal states, independent states, and also with, with Jordan, but it has to be based on equality. The other thing is what Abu Mazen said. He said um, that he's willing to accept international forces along the borders. He said, I don't mind even American Jewish troops on the, on the border, but not Israelis, Israeli yes, Jews. Right. So uh, there is, a, I think that we can, we, with goodwill, as Arafat used to say, with a will, how did he say it? Uh, with, with a will, there, there is uh, an agreement, and uh, with some creativity, I think that this can be solved. But so first we of all, are, we are political will. We're out of time. I wanna, um, we have a question from Dennis Corthier asking whether that we are, if this um, will be available as a video later, and it will be on, um, I believe, on the .org website, or you can follow the Twitter account, or probably however you signed up, you'll be able to see the video. Please do share it uh, with your friends when you do that. And I want to also say that we forgot to say at the beginning that Americans for Peace Now is a co-sponsor of this conversation, along with um, Pro Partners for Progressive Israel. I want to thank both of them for making it happen, and thank so many of you for being online and for your smart questions particularly in this moment of such like uncertainty and confusion about the news. I am going to um, give each of Akiva and Aloof one minute each to kind of say any last licks. We do have one other, one question pending that I was going to ask, which goes back to Israeli politics. James DeVore wanted to know what are the prospects of a secular uh, unity government? Um, to some extent, you already addressed that, but if you want to mention that, or say whatever your last thoughts are, just about a minute each, and then we're going to close it out. Thank you. Okay, well, you okay. first. Yeah, um, I think that uh, you need some minimal faith between the two big secular parties in order to form a kind of a secular government, because with lack of trust, I think that each of them um, will have always the suspicion that uh, when things get wrong, the other side will go to the uh, orthodox and they will not have any problem joining them. So I, I don't see this because, um, you know, to form a unity government, this is what is the alternative. 
to, you know, a secular government has to be a unity government, a, a Likud blue and white. But uh, there, there is not lost love or lost face between the two. So each of them will look behind its shoulders to see what the, the others are doing and if they are keeping some secret uh, dialogue a channel to the Orthodox parties, to Shas and uh, Agudat Israel. Um, I'm gonna, what, I'm gonna uh, I, we just need since, to finish uh, up, so just wrap it up and then Aluf gets his last word in. Yeah, so I, I wrap it up with saying, first of all, that I enjoyed very much um, being with you uh, and seeing you, Jody, and uh, having you moderating it. You are a fantastic moderator. <laughs> and uh, uh, I want to thank um, my friends in the Jewish liberal left-wing um, Jewish constituency. And I hope that you will send a clear message to the next president. Uh, and I will, you'll have to guess who is my favorite. Um, and to the next Congress. And as I said before, keep in mind that the two-state solution is a bipartisan issue. And this has to be the basis for support and the Congress will be willing to hear from you about it. Aluf? Well, thank you for the invitation. It was a good chance to see my, uh, even by video, my longtime mentor and friend Akiva. And uh, you, Jody, I, I have not yet, yet had the chance to congratulate you on your move to the forward and, and wish you good luck there. Last time we met was uh, in another uh, setup. Another time. Yeah. And, uh, and thanks uh, thank the participants. Uh, I think my, my final word would be that Israeli politics, in the end of the day, is reflecting the changes within Israeli society. If we had, and when we had these conversations, even five, let alone 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, we did not mention the Arab voice in Israel. We did not mention the ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, or religious voice as a kind of, 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 a, of a strong product that would originate a secular government. But today, the, the, the mainstream is shrinking because of the demographic changes in Israel and the growth of Arabic speaking and ultra Orthodox minorities. But the differences, as Akiva said, the differences between the two parts of the mainstream are stronger than the temptation to work with the minorities. Uh, Lieberman was trying to change that. So far he failed. Uh, and I don't believe that it, it, on this round, we're gonna see a, a secular unity government, but if we're going through another economic crisis, there would be a lot of pressure to cut back on government subsidies, on welfare, and other services that go mostly to the minorities at the expense of the taxpaying mainstream. And this could be the driving force towards cooperation against the minority power. Including the settlers. <laughs> including the, I agree, I agree, including the settlers. Everybody was over-subsidized and not paying enough taxes. Absolutely. Uh, thank you both so much. Um, and thank you to our hosts, Partners for Progressive Israel, Americans for Peace Now. Thank you again to many participants and questioners. And everybody, may you stay safe and healthy and virus-free um, or get the tests and care that you need. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.